Welcome to the NR OML Galleries and to an exhibition of sport and sports painting celebrating the Olympics. It's wonderful to see everybody here and I know that some of you have come uh, a distance so that makes it even more special. We are very proud and honoured to have a young tennis player, Grace, who's also uh, won a prize in mathematics recently and really that makes a link with this exhibition because sport and geometry are inextricably linked and geometry is obviously a serious branch of mathematics and geometry is part of the magic of composition and meaning in painting. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to begin by asking Grace to go through a backhand that I hope most of you are familiar with and I'm being a bit spoilt today, it's going to be slightly in slow motion so that I can do a charcoal drawing and you can watch me drawing and then after that, which we'll, I'll do for about 20 minutes or so, um, we'll move on to an oil painting and we'll see what results. Anyway, so I think we can begin and can everybody see well enough now? Um, Georgia, are you, are you going to be able to see what I'm doing? Um, is, is everybody feeling reasonably settled? That's lovely. And Grace, I need you to just imagine that the ball is making contact with your racket just in the middle of the swing. So just pretend that you're watching the ball onto the racket. That's, that's perfect. That's lovely. Well done. Perfect. So what I'm doing is I'm just seizing a moment whilst Grace is moving. And in a sense, you could say, how can you paint something, draw something that's moving? But every time I look, I'm taking a sort of snapshot in my mind. And really, whether Grace is moving or not, as soon as my eye... Um, uh, returns to the page, I'm taking my eye off the figure. So what I'm trying to say is that whether you're drawing or painting something, you can take a break, sorry, whether you're drawing or painting something still or moving, basically when you look up, you perceive something. And when you look at the page, you are actually working from memory. So one of the things I'm trying to say is that the difference between painting something, so to speak, still, even though shadows are moving all the time, painting or drawing something still is not so different from painting and drawing something that's moving, because each time you glance, you record, uh, you have a perception, and then you put it on the page. You will have noticed that sometimes when artists are working, they are 
looking and somewhere in between the two. So sometimes the key point that you're making, which might be the, would you like to pop, 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 see if you can do that in a, in a freeze moment? Like, and you're looking down as if the ball was right. And that's right, lovely. And if you can just bend the front knee a bit, that's right, we just be further through the shot. That's lovely. Um, so really, for instance, I might say that that outer part of the head is what I'm going to begin with. And then I'm looking out there, but I'm sensing where I am on the page. So while you're working, there's this kind of duality between, yes, I'm responding to the position of Grace's head, but I'm also aware of where this is on the rectangle. So those thoughts between what you see out there and where you are on the rectangle, you have all those thoughts, whether it's still or moving. So should we just carry on a little bit longer? Is, every, is everybody with me on this? Uh, do feel free to ask any questions. So the other thing that's interesting while I'm doing this is that in terms of a painting, which is more about contrast and tone, it's interesting to see that actually when we've got a backlit view, Grace's wonderful tennis whites are actually not the brightest thing we see. The brightest thing we see are the spotlights. We can imagine that she's playing at night or something. So in fact, the white of Grace's um, uh, tennis whites is not the lightest thing we see. The lightest thing, and I can't go any lighter than the page, is the lights behind her. So when you're doing a backlit view, quite often you can ask yourself this question, what's happening to white? And white quite often won't be the lightest thing you see. So uh, we're just going to carry on with this pose just a little bit longer. Grace, are you all right there? Doing a great job. Um, and then, of course, skin tones. If you're painting or drawing an athlete, um, and we'll come to that when I do the painting. So Grace's, the color of Grace's skin tones, when she's backlit, that is also darker than you might originally think. And all the time, I've got to be thinking, where is the center of gravity of, of Grace? I'm just going to move her head over a bit. The center of gravity is really a uh, concept that you think of when you're a physicist um, looking at an irregular shape and you try to work out where the center of gravity is. You can pause. Um, and a center of gravity in a figure is very important. And it's usually, because the head is the heaviest thing, going through, through the body and being communicated to the feet. So when I'm doing a drawing or a painting of a sports person, if we can move back to another slip, keep going with the slow motion, what I'm going to be asking myself is, where is the weight being transported from the head, the heaviest part of the body, through the torso to the ground? So center of gravity, very important in physics, in uh, 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 painting, and of course, center of gravity is crucial for sportsmen. So this concept can be applied across all the different disciplines. So the other thing I just want to point out while we go here is that um, usually people think of drawing as being dark on light. But what is quite fun is to use a rubber and to lift out where we see the light coming through from the back. You can lift out some of the charcoal and you can make some interesting marks working back into the picture. So. There are, this is called subtractive, which sounds slightly mathematical itself, doesn't it? So there are all sorts of links between maths and sport and drawing. So now, uh, what I want to do is we can just keep going. Grace, are you all right there? Yeah, Lovely backhands. The opposition are really in trouble. <laughs> So there we have the beginnings of a, of a sports, um, sports painting, which I then might check with a photograph um, and looking 
observing as much as I possibly can. So let's try now doing a forehand in the same position. Oh, um, when you're working with charcoal, uh, the, and I don't know if any of you know about fixative, which is a wonderful thing, but I think actually, Jared, I was going to say I was going to step outside for this, but I think what I'll do, um, instead of using the fixative indoors, which is not a good idea, I'm going to just rip this picture off the pad and um, start another drawing. Very good. Are you feeling comfortable your distance from what's behind you? Oh, yes. Good, good, very good. I think the other thing that's important with um, drawing or painting sport and movement is deciding what is the moment you're trying to capture. And for me, one of the exciting moments is when the ball is on the racket. But everybody who plays tennis or doesn't play tennis will have a different moment that they'd be trying to catch. But uh, if one's got some choice, for me, the, uh, the moment of, that's interesting is the moment of impact with the ball on the racket. Does anybody have any questions at the moment? So we're just going to try now doing a different view. One of the things which I now I can see that I started with where the weight has been transferred to the legs. And I've suddenly realized, no, that's not going to look very good in that rectangle. So I'm going to move the front leg back. And I beg you, when you are drawing and painting, if you suddenly think, oops, I've made a mistake, don't be sad, be happy. Because nearly always, mistakes lead to better paintings. And when it comes to movement, all those hesitant searching marks will add up to a summary of the movement that you've seen. So everything helps. Don't be disappointed if you have to make alterations. Think of that as giving you stronger foundations. Do you always start with the legs? Well, I think that's a very good question. I think partly that's happening because of the position that I'm in. Um, I'm quite low down. Uh, here, um, and I think I'm trying to choose the moment of uh, the shot that I'm going to try to capture. Um, but you want to really be thinking about the figure as a whole. So yes, I was thinking about the legs first, and when I did those marks, I was beginning to think of the figure as a whole. So you're jumping bet between the two all the time. You're jumping between the particular and the general in the figure, and the particular out there and the general. So there's this constant duality. You may see that I'm half closing my eyes. And that is a very helpful thing for um, artists to do. And that has got a scientific basis because when you are looking with, through half-closed eyes, you're cutting out the cones that see color. And you are seeing with the rods that just see black and white. And simplifying it into black and white helps you just see contrasts of light and dark, which is primarily what you're trying to achieve in a drawing. So half closing your eyes enables you to say, right, what is the darkest thing I see? What is the lightest thing? And I'm trying not to think about the objects in front of me. I'm just trying to think of abstract shapes. The lovely thing about charcoal is you can build up, that's where we are at the moment, you can build up lights and darks. If you think of drawings and paintings being broken into five steps, you might say that the lightest thing, we well, can't go light in the paper, is your number one, and the darkest might be Grace's lovely uh, dark hair. That could be the darkest thing I see at five. And then, surprisingly, then um, the 
the second, uh, sorry, the second lightest thing we're looking at is probably um, Grace's tennis whites, which are darker than the highlights around her. And we're getting little bits of light peeping through. So I might slightly exaggerate the depth of the tone of her, her um, tennis whites and then lift it out with the rubber because I can do, I can get some interesting marks that way which can be suggestive of not just light, but also of movement. So I'm just going to carry on now, half closing my eyes, looking where Grace is holding uh, the racket when I think she is making impact with our imaginary ball. And her opponent is... Um, having a dreadful time racing around, catching all these forehands. One of the things I discovered going around the country, uh, drawing and painting sportsmen, is how important it is to paint the feet, because that is where the athlete is getting their, and again, to bring in some physics, action and reaction. For every force there is equal an opposite reaction and it's very important for grace to be balanced when she makes the shot so that it'll have some strength to it and um so how her feet connect with the ground affects the strength and effectiveness of her shot and how i draw her feet affects whether i capture the pose or not so feet and the center of gravity is all very important. So that really is just a kind of a first quick sketch to capture um, key tones and the darkest, the lightest. We've said that the costume would be number two. That's the second lightest. Can anybody with half closing their eyes tell me what else might be another number two, second, um, second lightest tone? Shoes, absolutely, and that leads us to shadow. And so, if Grace can carry on, what we've got here is we've also got wonderful shadows, because it's backlit, which will definitely help fasten um, the pose onto the plane. And one of the things you may have noticed in the tennis player paintings, you, that there are lines in the court, and how where the player is and how they play the shot depends don't worry don't worry uh, depends on where the player's positioned within the lines so we can use the lines for the composition do uh, are you going to be comfortable there so we've now said that the lights are number one tone the clothes shoes and shadows are number two the darkest tone we see is Grace's hair. And what do we think is the second darkest thing that um, we can see? The second, the second darkest, not as dark as the hair. And uh, I think we'll exclude the carpeted awning. The shadow of the legs. I think the shadow of the legs might be the same color as the, sh the clothes. A very, very soft shadow. The, the shoes may even be a three, a little bit darker than the shadow on the ground. But, but you know, we think of skin tones being very light. And I think we can all agree that actually Grace's uh, lovely tanned skin is actually probably our number four. So, Grace, you can take a break now. And um, I'm going to mix up some colours uh, in those five steps 
of uh, light and tone, one to five, and do a little painting. But you can sit down now for the moment. Anybody got any questions at the moment? Is everybody comfortable enough? Anybody need to sit down? Um, anybody coming from the back? Um, Shalane, would your children like to sit at the front? Yes, they're, already they're already there. All right, then. OK. So what I'm going to do, I think some of you may have been to my um, talks on uh, painting light with complementary colours. And just to sort of keep in line with that, I'm only going to use the three primaries for this little study. Um, and we'll, we'll mix them up in exactly the same way as we did before with three primaries and three secondaries. But there is one little bit of an exception is I love permanent green light. It's a wonderful colour to use for the preliminary drawing. And it's also a very good uh, help when you're doing a painting and you've got stuck. Uh, redrawing in green can be a great way of finding a way back into a painting that seems to have uh, uh, slightly lost its direction. But we're going to start with the green, and we may come back to the green if we need to restate um, any points with any kind of precision. This wonderful stuff called Liquin, uh, which looks as though it might have come from Sainsbury's, but it's from the art shop. And that's a fast drying agent, and it's very handy if you want to work on a painting over two consecutive days. Now, when we're mixing up the colours, you have to resist reaching for the brushes and just concentrate on using a palette knife and you'll find that much the easiest way to mix up the colours. So Grace, if you'd like to just sit sort of sideways on, I'm just, all I'm going to do is I'm going to spare you, um, can you sort of, uh, yep, and just drop your knees over uh, the other way, that's great, so, so that I'm just going to let you rest a bit whilst I mix up some colours. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to go, the lightest light that I can make is the lights in the, up at the front. And I, those may or may not be in the picture, but they're going to be my reference point. I'm going to move this out of the way. Now the darkest thing that we can see, we've agreed, is um, Grace's lovely hair. So I'm going to make a dark colour with the blue and a bit of orange added. Now that's turned a bit green, so the opposite of green is red. A bit more blue. And there, that is about the darkest colour that I'm going to be able to make. I can add a bit more blue to it. But that's the colour of Grace's hair in the shade. Now, we talked about the uh, second lightest thing being the tennis whites that Grace is wearing. So I'm going to mix up a, a, a very pale blue, but in order to sort of slightly kill off the blueness, does anybody remember what the complementary opposite to blue is? It's the sum of the other two primaries. If we've got blue, the other two primaries are yellow and red. Can anybody tell me what yellow and red make? Well done. So I'm adding orange to a blue, which will then subdue some of the blueness and turn it to a very useful gray. So that's going to be my tone number two. Now, we said that the next lightest tone from the darkest color was Grace's skin tone. So that's going to be a bit fun. Anybody ready? Everybody ready for this? We like to think that if you're fair-skinned, that you have um, a bit of red mixed with white, so you um, can have a kind of uh, pink, you know, for a fair complexion. But one of the things my tutor at art school told me, and uh, she was taught by somebody who'd been 
uh, taught by a pupil of Sickert's, and she said there was an unbroken chain between her tutor uh, through Sickert back to Raphael. And one of the most fascinating things of the many things she taught me about painting is that when it comes to skin tones, there's more green in skin tones than you realize. So let's make some green. There's a very simple green made out of the two primaries. And we're going to add that green to the pink. Can everybody see? Grace, I'm going to turn this around so you can see as well. So there's a green, quite acid green. And there, I think everybody would agree, is a much improved skin tone by adding two complementary colors to each other. Red and green are complementary opposites, and added together, they make a great skin tone. So that would be a great color for the color of um, Grace's skin when it's got a highlight. But we're really interested in mixing a number four tone. So what I've got to do is I've got to do the same thing all over again, but I'm going to make all the colors deeper. So we're beginning with a deep pinkish color. And I'm going to add uh, green to that. So I'm going to make a supply of green over here. Add a bit more green. And already, without that much mixing, we've got quite a good skin color in the shade. And you can have different amounts of green added to make it darker, uh, to make it look as though Grace has just come back from holiday. <laughs> um, so we'll make that our number four. And then our number three colors really are some deeper grays, because I think we all agreed that the shoes were uh, darker. So I'm going to make a gray, and this is where the complementary pairings can be so helpful. We're starting with a darker blue, and I'm adding some orange to that. Went a bit too far. Don't be, don't be depressed. Just keep adding the blue. Now, if you think about this has come out a little bit green, so we add the complementary opposite. Bit of red. That might be a bit darker than we actually need, so I'm going to just go backwards a bit. But there is a very useful uh, number three tone for the shoes. And that, so the lightest is the lights, that's number one. The darkest is hair, number five. Number two is uh, tennis whites and shadow. Number four is skin tone in the shade. And then the middle tone, this number three tone, is the hardest to see, the hardest to find. And I think the only way to find it is by going one, five, two, four, three, and then you can see it. And if you say to me, well, Sarah, I'm just going to get my color, uh, uh, my camera with color film out, and I'm going to see the colors that way. And I can just tell you that you won't, because color film makes the midtones flee to the light or flee to the dark. In a color photo, all these magical midtones that we've been mixing up that are 90% of the painting, they're not highlights and they're not the deepest darks. If you use a camera, almost every single time, it'll make a number two tone and a number three tone appear like one or one and a half. And it'll make number three tones and number four tones look like five or four and a half. And very little will be in the middle but that's what you want. That is actually the body of your painting, is in those mid-tones. So, Grace, are you feeling uh, strong enough to get up? And um, I'm just going to choose a canvas from here. You see that I've just put a tiny bit of a tone on it so that the lightest lights will jump out from this. And I've now just thinking a little bit about the composition, whether I'm going to do 
a um, standing picture like the uh, drawings or whether I might uh, reduce the picture and make it horizontal. Now, in fact, I'm going to go for horizontal. And when I was saying, you know, you have to be, have to do some dual thinking when you're an artist, yes, I've got these sketches because I was trying to think about the center of gravity and the position of the limbs. But what is tennis about? Tennis is about balls flying over the net, backwards and forwards, side and side. So really, I think this painting would benefit from being this way up because that's related to how you look at tennis. You could do so many different studies working along these lines until you do a painting that you say, yes, that captures something of the magic of the moment and the sport that you've been looking at. And like a scientist or like a cook working out a new recipe, you just have to keep trying, build on the principles you've heard, and rely on happy accident to help you find new directions. But there's just nothing like the essence of learning is repetition and the essence of producing a good painting is to have a go, have another go, until you feel you've caught the moment that you're interested in. So now I'm going to reach for the brushes. Can everybody see all right? I've actually, now the other thing you might notice is that you know, if you see a sort of standard artist's um, studio, the kind of brushes that you see look like that. But can I tell you that I think, save your money and save your effort, and, you know, if you look at any of the greats, Renoir and Monet and others, there is no way they were doing those minute shifts. Say, one of the best painting experiences you can have in London is go to the court hold and there's a Renoir, the lady at the opera, wearing a white dress with the black fur lining in a lovely snaky shape. And she's wearing white gloves and there is just a shift in tone between one and two, or between one and one and a half, made by a white and an incredibly soft grey. And I'm absolutely sure, I'll have a bet with anybody, he was using brushes like this and not using brushes like that. So if you feel more confident with brushes like these, then they're the brushes to use. So I'm going to start now with um, Grace give it, beating up the, her opponent on the other side of the net. And I'm going to start, do you notice how I've tried to keep everything within easy reach and how the tub for carrying everything becomes a sort of table? So I'm just going to use a bit of green. And Grace, I think we're going to carry on with the forehand. All right, can everybody see well enough? lovely what you're doing is just great if you can just keep going a bit longer that's wonderful and just remember to look at that imaginary ball meeting your rack racket head focus on that that's wonderful now you see sometimes I'm looking up and I'm looking at uh, Grace, and sometimes I'm looking at the canvas. So there's never a dull moment when you're painting. You're either looking out there and transposing to, this is just the beginning. I'm just trying to work out where does this want to be uh, in the canvas? Um, where is the racket head going to be? Where is the center of gravity? And I am not thinking about arms and legs. I'm literally looking for points and positioning them on the, on the canvas.
Um, one of the things I'm sure some of you will have heard of before when you're drawing, and in fact I am sort of drawing with the brush, is to think not only of the shapes and lines that you see before you, but also to look at the spaces between things. I think you may have heard of negative space. So, you know, at the, having got to that stage, I'm thinking of what is the shape between Grace, her, between her waist and her free arm, and what is the shape between the lower part of each of her legs. I hope you don't mind me speaking about you like this. But um, so that helps me. Instead of worrying too much, have I got the leg right? I just think, no, actually, I'm going to think about the space between the legs rather than worrying too much about any one individual thing. In fact, really, when you're painting, you are painting relationships. You're not painting uh, any one thing. You're painting, uh, you're painting an arm in relationship with the rest of the body. So now, having just roughly put the figure in like that, I'm now going to uh, reach for other brushes and we're going to begin with the lightest light that I can make is the lights in the background, but we're not making that the key part of the picture, but that is the lightest color that I can have and I'm putting it in as a sort of marker. Then we've said that the darkest color is Grace's hair and as, that, as it's backlit and a bit in shadow, I'm going to begin by adding a little bit of extra blue to it. Again, you can see that I'm half closing my eyes to look at shape. Okay, so then the next, so we've done the lightest and the darkest. So the next lightest we said were the um, tennis whites. So when I'm doing this, I'm just trying to think about the shapes I see before me. And some areas in a bit more shadow than others. So that's my tone number two. And we also said we thought that the shadow was uh, tone number two. And I'm going to put that in, but I'm going to just add a bit of blue to it. Um, because I want to differentiate it from the, um, from the clothes. So then, we've done the darker, so now we're going to look for tone number four, that's skin tones. So we've got that there. Again, I'm trying to paint a shape. Every time I put a mark down, I'm trying to paint a shape. Actually, one thing I should have thought of was um, the color of the racket. Does anybody want to tell me what, whether it's a one? Anybody in the front row want to tell me if the racket is a one or a five? Or any, any, any suggestions? I think, I think it might be a five with a, a couple of, couple of, um, uh, a couple of number twos there. So I'm just going to capture the racket then with some darks.
Very good. Grace, you're doing a great job. I think you're winning. Six, six loves. <laughs> Five love. I don't think they've got any answers to your shots. And then for a bit of fun, I've got one brush left over. I've got a bit of yellow here and the fabulous green. So I'm just going to put the ball in just there. So this is just a very, very quick sketch, but it shows you how, thank you very much, Grace. It shows you, I hope, how you can break down what you see into some steps. And at this point, if you wanted to take the painting any further and you wanted to uh, move on more, you could get the green out again and mark some of the key places. You could, uh, if you wanted, dive into the uh, uh, white and add some really chunky bits of light spilling over from behind. But that's when it's over to you and how you want to finish the picture to make it your own. So, um, <laughs> um, Grace, thank you so much. Um, now, does, is there anything I can help anyone with? Um, any, any questions you might um, have? Or are, are any of you uh, thinking of uh, doing a painting this summer holidays and you want some advice on a checklist or, um, you know, it would be helpful to have a little bit more uh, stuff on complementary colours or whatever. Do, uh, the question was, do I ever use acrylics and not oils? And I have been asked this question several times. Um, I think there is something in the consistency of oil paints that just gives it a kind of yummy, if that's not an overused adjective, <laughs> uh, yummy quality. And I find with acrylics, they're either very runny or very coagulated, and you don't get much in between. But oils will be as thin and washy as you like, and they will be as heavy as in, and in pastoey as you like and everything in between so I think if you're going for flexibility I would definitely go for oils and now that they make this wonderful stuff um, I, I liquid this painting will be dry tomorrow and if I wanted to work on it further and put in grass and scoreboard and cheering crowd um, I could work on it before we had liquid um, people like Sickert would turn a painting to the fire overnight and often with disastrous results because it would get covered in soot or burnt. So uh, we're very lucky to have modern chemicals. So I would urge you, um, I, uh, you know, as long as you rinse your brushes out carefully with your Terps or White Spirit, your brushes will last, your brushes will prefer oils, and I would urge you to use oils. <laughs> but do you add liquid to every colour, or did you put it on? I put it, um, actually it's slightly slipped here, but quite often, um, I put the liquid into the lid of a, uh, a, a jar like that and then I sort of dip into it as you would if you were using water for watercolours or anything. In fact, I brought my watercolours with me to show you the watercolours that I use over the summer um, and they are almost identical um, colours as I use in oil and everything that I've said about colour mixing in oil is absolutely true for watercolours as well. The primer is actually, surprisingly, an acrylic primer. Um, so yes, I get hardboard and I get it cut up uh, into all these um, different shapes so that when I go out I've got a choice of different proportions and a choice of different backgrounds. And the primer is white and it's acrylic because you can put oil on acrylic but you can't put acrylic on oil. And there's something about the finish of acrylic primer that's less slippery than oil primer. So I, I would recommend, yes, acrylics when you're doing the priming, but oils when you're mixing the colours. Everything that I've got should fix, fit into the tub. So um, 
you should be able to take your paints wherever you want. I've got a bag uh, now, and I can fit a canvas about that size with my paints over my shoulder with a pannier. And this year in March, when we had the wonderful weather, I managed to get myself down to paint at Putney uh, uh, water practice paintings up to 12 by 16, all on the bike. I didn't need the car. And, and that was a great feeling. That was a great feeling. And, you know, I, I look as though I need loads of equipment, but you can narrow it down and you can get there on a bike and get back on a bike. And that is a great feeling. Question, a very good question. When do I launch out into the bigger brushes? Um, I use them infrequently, but I use them when you've got bigger canvases and bigger areas to fill. But really, when it comes to bigger areas, I quite like these um, DIY brushes that are 36p each. And um, Sickert was notorious for never cleaning his brushes. He just left them lying around and had new brushes every day. But um, most of us are much more into recycling than that. And you can, uh, these cover beautifully and they are soft and responsive and they're Chinese brushes and you could imagine doing calligraphy with them because they do have um, a sort of expressiveness about them. These are great brushes. But yes, I do use these, but not often. Larger areas, bigger paintings. And um, one other tip is if you are going on a bike to do a painting and you happen to do a little board painting, what I do to bring them back in the bicycle pannier is I get a bit of tape and I make the tape into a sort of little, what I call a ball bearing. Uh, um, you just kind of make a little ball like that and you put one at each corner secured. Tape is invaluable stuff. If it's windy, you can use the tape to stop your easel blowing over. Just I've done that before. Guy rope. Ta uh, tape is guy rope. Um, it's all part of the fun. And you do a little corner like that on each of the four corners, and then you get an unused board, and you put it like that, and your painting is drying on the way home. And I've done that on aeroplanes quite often when I come back from America. The paintings may even be dry, but I bring them back in a camper bag, a hand luggage on the plane, because they may not be perfectly dry, and it's much better than squashing them. So that, that can be a method of transport for dry or wet paintings. Thank you very much. Well, sometimes I put a piece of string down, um, but most of the time I just do it and try to think about the whole picture. Again, it's this duality thing. You don't fixate on, I'm holding the brush and doing this. I'm making this line and I'm looking at the whole canvas. And as soon as you're thinking about two things at once, it all becomes easy. Does that make sense? Also, then you get a second chance. You know, once it's dry, then you can put a different tone down. You get a second chance. Now this, this is... For squaring up. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's my own recent invention, actually. Um, I'm just going to step this way with my friend, the microphone. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. And, um, yes, uh, actually, Jared, you might want to film this. Um, um, this is moving up from a smaller picture to a bigger picture. Um, I'm not a great fan of squaring up uh, because I think that actually even if your bigger canvas is exactly the same proportions expanded up, there's going to be something that's varying less regularly if you were thinking it in maths. And therefore I do an approximation and it means that when I make the marks on the larger canvas, I can think about that mark in relationship to the whole big rectangle, not where is it in relation to this little square. And you find that you do shift and pull things because it isn't just a, you're not locked into a geometric progression. Or if you are, 
you may lose some self-expression and some freedom and some magic. But you have to put the squares on the big canvas. No, no, you well, don't. no. You what just... I do is I do some ticks. Ah, I do okay. a tick. Yes, right. Well, this is a very good question. I do some ticks in the same proportion, same proportion. and then I'll use a tape measure and do some ticks yeah, and sometimes I nice. keep them and sometimes I don't and I think for this painting I actually hardly used anything right, yes. but on others you'll see the remnants of a few little um, uh, matrix yes, yes, positions. Right, yeah. yes. You can do it with pencil of course. Yes. You know, but you see the it. thing is you don't just want to be thinking where is the head in relation to the square on there. You also want to be thinking about where is the head in relationship to the whole picture. And if you get locked into the grid, you're going to stop thinking about that. Mm. I don't think I can repeat often enough that mistakes help paintings and mistakes help m create movement uh, more than anything else. So, mis you know, mis you learn from mistakes in life. And mistakes are nothing to be frightened about if they're little ones and then they can actually strengthen you.